Praise the Lord. Happy Sabbath. The Lord is good, isn't He? And I'm thankful for that grace. It's nice to hear. Not only you can read about it in the Word of God, but the songs that are sung. Because I'm still amazed. And I pray today that you are amazed of His grace in your heart and in your life. It's by His grace that we're here. By His grace we're saved, aren't we? And I am still amazed by that. Thank you for that. I appreciate it so very much both specials. This music is, is a wonderful thing. It lifts our heart to God. Prepares us to break the bread of life together. And always there's a custom here is I want to pray once again. We had a lot of prayer already today, but I always feel the need one more time to go to God in prayer. I'm going to kneel up here. If you'd like, you can kneel with me. Those who are at home can do the same thing. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you once again. You've reminded us this morning of your grace and how amazed we are that you can love us as you look down and see our heart, you know who we are, everything about us, and you still say, I still love you. Lord, I'm thankful for that today. Thank you for that we are blood-bought. Thank you that a price has been paid, the infinite price on Calvary. We accept that today by faith. Bless now we pray through the power of thy Holy Spirit. Every word, Lord, may it penetrate the hearts and the minds of your children today. Not just here in this group, Lord, but around the world. May we be ready for your soon coming. Lord, forgive me of anything in my heart and life that needs not be there. I want to be a vessel to be used today. May we be able to hear your voice, not man's. May we stand behind the cross of Calvary. And may Jesus be seen as my prayer today as we thank you again for the precious souls that are here. In Jesus' name, amen. This is our third part that we've been talking about. So bless your hearts if you've missed the first two. Uh, they, they may have them down where you could get them if you want, but we're talking about blood-bought inheritance. You know, that's the subject. Somebody would say, well, boys, this is the third part. You're on it. Listen, every week from now till Jesus comes, we could talk about the infinite sacrifice because we're blood-bought. And being blood-bought, it's an ongoing thing, isn't it? Every day of my life, I need that blood. I need a fresh application of it. Because for my life, that I might be ready to meet Jesus. You have your Bibles, please turn with me. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, just going to read a verse here. Kind of set our tone as we heard the beautiful music. Both specials I appreciate so very much that God is, is tuning us up today. Now, I pray that you are in tune. Now look, if you've had things that bothered you this week, throw them outside the door. This is a time that we what? Come together with heaven. This is an opportunity for heaven to speak to you. Every time you open the pages of God's word, God speaks to you. Now that is grace, isn't it? As I'm amazed by that, that he would speak to someone like me. Praise God. He's interested in each one of us. In John chapter 12, in verse 48, very interesting Verse, because we're, we're talking and we have been talking about blood bought. Verse 48, are you there? Yes. Praise God. Verse 48 said, He that rejecteth me, who's it talking about? Good, yes. Person that rejects Jesus, right, and receiveth not his words or Jesus' words, hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. My question, is it important today that we pay attention to what God, what Christ has said? Why? The same shall judge him in the last days. So it's very imperative in our Christian experience that we feed, we feast on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. As we've been studying about being blood-bought, it's just stirred my heart. It's put a, 
I want to say it the right way for all of us, a fire inside. Inside, each one of us needs that spiritual fire going on to where something has to come out. We can no longer remain silent because of the price that was paid for each and every one of us. Blood bought inheritance, part of that family of God. But as we've talked about it the last several weeks, we can be assured because of the message we have to give, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of the truth of His words that He's spoken here that will judge us in the last days, the enemy is displeased. He's not happy with any of us. And so He's going to try to stir us up just a little bit. So errors come in that will dim the spiritual perceptions of man. Now remember, it's all around us. I'm not going to be aware of it if I don't know what truth is. But you can be assured because of the message, because of the blood, because of the power, because of the spirit, the devil is going to bring. People learning truth, truth sanctifies you. It sets you apart. And as we think about that, the devil then says, no, I can't, I can't have this. And so he tries to, now he didn't say he's going to snuff it completely out. Somebody stay with me. He simply says he wants to dim the spiritual perceptions because the Bible says spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So if, I, if I'm dimmed a little bit, you know what it is to be dimmed? Has anybody ever went to the eye doctor, uh, Chris, this week when she come back and her pupils of her eye, I, well, I couldn't even see what color eyes she had because there's great big old pupils there staring at her. She couldn't see anything. Now, you think I'm going to trust her to drive with me in there? I think she was doing a little driving. But with me in there, I'm going to say no. Why? Because you're, you, 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 something, you, you're, you view, your eyes, just, you're not viewing things properly. They're dimmed. They're blurred. So the devil says, don't necessarily have to take the truth away from you. But if I can just blur it a little bit where you don't understand what truth is, I've got you. And sometimes we just don't understand that. I've heard this ask many times, would it be all right if I, ooh, if I go listen to air? I have an obligation now to go, and, but I know what some teaching there, it just doesn't quite harmonize. This is heavy duty. You're blood bought, remember. You're purchased with a price. Air is from the enemy, we understand. Truth is from God, isn't it? But you know, I've come to learn that I need to be careful about listening to air. Because it affects me. It dims my perception, spiritual perceptions. I read this in early writings, page 125. It says, God is displeased. Now when I read that, when God is displeased, I want to know what He's displeased about. If God looked at you today and said, I'm displeased with you, what would be your response? God's merciful and gracious, and I'm very thankful. God, I think about every day. He'd look, he'd say, Kenny, I'm displeased. He's loving and kind. He tries to get our attention and to guide us, but you know, we're not maybe where we should be, where we ought to be as we really behold Him. What does it really take for heaven to be our home? And so when I read this, God is displeased with us when we go to listen to air. Some of you say, well, it doesn't make any difference. I, lift, I listen to Brother so-and-so on some channel, whatever. Well, you know, he's not preaching all the truth, but you know, some of the truth is good. God is displeased when you listen to air. When you know that it's air, when you know the teaching is going to be air, why do you want to listen? Why would you want to listen to that? Are you, oh, oh, we're smart enough, right? We'll just sort out the air and we'll take, you know, leave the bad and take the good. That Listening to that bad has an impression. It makes an impression. You may not say, oh, well, it's over, but there's an impression there because you're listening to it. And when you listen to it, you give the enemy opportunity to push it home. He's going to push it home somehow, some way. God is not pleased when we listen to error. So anything that you know, now listen. And then it goes on, it says, without being obliged to go. So I heard people say, well, I go over here and I listen to this. I really don't want to. Boy, I'm obliged to go. Do you realize what obliged really means? Don't go listen to air unless you are compelled to go. That means morally, physically, and it could even be legally. That's what that word means. There may be times you've given your word, so you need to be careful when you give your words. You may have to, you're, you're obligated to do that. 
That word there means you're indebted to. So we have to be very careful about that. Listen, unless what? Unless He, God, sends us. Do not go unless God sends us and know that God is sending you to the meeting where air is forced home by the what? Huh? By, the, by the will, power of the will. So human beings are forcing home air. They may believe in it theirself. You know better because the Bible teaches something a little differently. But the human, now remember, when air comes in, it's forced by the human will. When truth comes in, right, it's accompanied by the power and the Holy Spirit to penetrate the heart, the mind, the life, to make us new and fresh. This is, this is exciting when the Spirit works upon us, but the devil's going to do his little forcing if he can. Notice this. Here's the problem. You say, well, I, I can listen. Listen, Spirit of Prophecy says, if we go listen without being obliged to go, whether we're almost like a force to go or an obligation without breaking our word, whatever, God will not keep us. The angels of heaven, think about it, angels of heaven cease their watchful eye and care over us. We are left to the buffetings of the enemy. Why? The article goes on and says, because the light has become contaminated with darkness. That's like places where you, ooh, where you know you shouldn't be going. When you go to places you know you shouldn't or go, <laughs> you open up, you know, the box where you shouldn't be going in there, you know, the, the angels leave us. Think about those who maybe we start nightclubs and taverns just so people get a general idea of that. You're, you don't partake of those things, but you want to go in there. Maybe You need to be careful because when you step in those kind of places, you do not have the protection of the angels of heaven. They must leave you. Why? Because you know better. It's not a place unless you're specifically going there to get somebody out. To witness, to grab somebody out. You don't just hang around in places like that. Well, you think, you, you think you're fit to beat the enemy? You think you're powerful enough to do that? That you can go there anyway? No. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, it says, Ye are all the children of light. Mm -hmm. Why, you're blood-bought. You're the children of light. Not of darkness. And I'll tell you, besides all this other, you can talk on it for days, but you know what? I don't have the time to listen to fables. I don't have time to listen to untruths. I had a guy on the phone the other day. We've been, he, he listens to Dare to Dream all the time. So he's calling and talking. And he's practically weeping. He said, I don't know what to do. Because the preacher tells me one thing and other friends and people tell me something else. And they encourage me to read some other books here and there and do other things. I don't know what to do. Can you tell me what I... I have been under the impression, he says, that in order to find truth, I just need the Bible spirit of prophecy. And I look and I find out what the truth is on the issue, then I know that I've got it, but some people, even the minister, tell me, no. I'm becoming confused. I said, don't be confused. In work like this, as some of you know, everybody, I want to say it nicely, everybody and their brother sends their stuff to you to, to read and to be an encouragement. And sometimes when you're doing programmings on certain things, and I let people know right now if I'm doing a certain program on something, I will not read anything that man has written. What's inspired? Spirit of prophecy in the Bible to find what I understand is, is the truth of the issue. Afterwards, oh, you can look at it and gaze at it if you want, but I don't want to be influenced by any person. I hope you don't. That's not trying to say, oh, they're not. It doesn't. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I don't want to change or alter anything. Add to or lessen. The Bible says their name's going to be out. The book of life. But I want to know what the truth is. We're children of the light. 2 Timothy 4, 4 talks about, you know, that the time will come that we turn our ears away from what? We turn our ears away from the truth. See, we're living in that hour right now. Most people don't know it. They're just lifting up their hands and say, oh, God is good. We've come to a time where we'd rather hear a lie than the truth. A lie because, oh, well, it's a, a truth demands a change in your life. And many people don't want to make that change. The Bible says it, doesn't it? 
They're going to turn away their ears from the truth and what? And they're going to be turned into fables. We live in the time in the history of the world because of all the gadgets out there that many times we're happy. We like to hear what? Fables. Story time. You know, who did what to where? Who when? Fables. Not, don't necessarily hear the truth. It's a big lie. But we like to hear that. We're, we're growing accustomed to it. The enemy's working on us. False doctrines, dangerous doctrines are pressed upon the mind. Friend, I, like, I want to think blood-bought. We don't need these false doctrines. They're dangerous errors. And an error is dangerous when it's pressed upon the mind. Why? Because you will not be dwelling upon the truth. Does that make sense? If we have these errors going, pressing on our minds, we can't understand what truth is. And truth, God gives us to fit us and to prepare the house of Israel to stand in the day of the Lord. Listen, friends, we are nearing standing, you see, the day of the Lord. It's near even at the door right now as I speak. If you don't see it, say, God help me to see it. It's near even at the door. So you gain the whole world and then you lose your own soul. Do you see it? Too many people today say, well, I know what I should do, but oh, I can't do it right now. My job or I need the income. I need this. I need that. No. Though you gain the whole world, what does it benefit, the Bible says? What will it benefit you? Not a thing. Ask some of these people that seem like they have the whole world. Seem like four or five or six of them have the whole world. They got their billions of dollars. They own the world. They turn the world. They turn the heads of the presidents. They turn the heads of the legislative people. Because they've got money. And sad to say, but people can be bought. But so you gain the whole world. God means what He says when... See, when the church members embrace error, this is what God would have us to do. This is very important. Remember, you're blood bought. The great price was paid. But the devil says, okay, I'm going to press air in. I can't stop them from coming to church. But I'm going to get some air pushed in here. I'm talking about deceptions. I'm talking about misrepresentations. I'm talking about falsehood, air. And when they come in, they, oh, oh, they come in under the cloak of religion and right. And, well, surely you would want to do this. Mm. Well, I'm going to say, surely, where is it found? Won't you? Where is it found? Come on, if it's in here, I'm with you. Well, here's what we're to do. This will help us. How does the church handle these kind of situations? The blood-bought church. The infinite price that was paid for the church, the people. Already lay down and quit and lay down and die. We, no, we, we've got to do something. Spirit of Prophecy says the church of God should move straight along as though there were not such a people in the world. Somebody's trying to steer you the wrong way. How do you meet it on? So the church needs to just move on like it just. They, you, you go ahead. You don't worry about what somebody may go to the right, somebody may go to the left, but the church moves on. Man said, that's, that's what we should be doing. And then it goes on, it says, but there should be, and I believe this, decided efforts put forth to show those, she says here, are unchristian in their life. That's heavy duty. That means unchristlike. Yes. Jesus said, he who is not what? With me is, is against me. No middle ground here. You're not 80% Christian and 20% of the world. How can you say I'm 80% Christian and 20% the devil? There's nobody going to say that. But that's the facts. You can't be it. What? You say, well, I'm eight. No, you. he said you either are or you're not. Well, I'm 90% Jesus. No. He doesn't accept that. It's all or nothing. Can't have any part of the world's enmity against God. So we did go, it says here, no, we're to encourage them to show their, their wrongs. If they do not reform, they should be separated from the precious and holy whom God has chosen to clean and purify and to, and to honor. Do not, notice this, do not dishonor him 
Not by linking and uniting the clean with the unclean. We'll all have that difficulty at times. But we cannot unite the two. It either is or it isn't. I hear all the time, and you do too, it's a gray area. Well, somebody get real with me. Gray? You know where you get, you, how, do you, how do you get gray? You mix black and white together, truth and error, and you mix a little of them together and you come up with gray. I've never seen that in the Word of God where it's gray, or, well, I'll just leave it up to you. You decide. You realize that most people think it's just left up to you to do what you want to do. There's no guideline. There's nothing. It's just... However I feel at the time. You ever hear people say, well, I feel like I'm not willing to do What does the Word say? If I, hey, if I did what I felt like sometime, look out. No, well, God help me. See, as a child, you are blood-bought. We need to understand. Let me make this comment about Bible sanctification because this is what the enemy fears. He gets up in arms when you're justified in a moment, praise God, in the outer court. When you begin to walk the life, see, that's kind of people say, well, you just believe. The Bible is very clear. It says only believe. But as you study in principle, you see you've got to go on from that. There's not that. The devil believes and what? And he trembles. He's lost cause, but he believes. you got the angels, the wicked angels. They're trembling in their boots. The devil is shaky. He's scared to death. As the weakest saint prays, the devil trembles. Oh, I'm scared to death. Look at the devil, all the power he has. He has nothing over the weakest saint. I'm the weakest saint, but I pray in faith, believing the devil shakes in his boot. He don't want any part of what? It ain't me he sees. He sees Jesus living in you and me. He's scared to death. He was cast out once. He's going to be cast out again. He was put to the test to run. He's going to be running again. The day will come when he will be and burn. They'll be all over with. There'll be no more enemy. Praise God. Whew. You get thinking about these things, I get excited. Or a time where the devil's not hounding you every minute. Yes. Where there's peace and contentment and joy and happiness. But I'm telling you, the devil says, well, until then, there's a couple, of, there's two groups of people that I am going to work over. Now, if you fit in one of these, get out. Get out of it today. There's no use to stay in it. But no one's judging you, but you figure out if you're, if you're in one of these groups. You may not be, but notice. The ones the devil says, I'm going to work over. Now, remember, first of all, True Bible sanctification that we discussed before. There cannot be true biblical sanctification if one little jot, one little tittle of, you know, of, of truth is left behind. Is somebody with me? You cannot leave any portion of the truth behind and reach that sanctified walk with Jesus. You can't do it. Because when you deny that part of what you know is true, but you don't want to change, well, the neighbors will laugh at me. The husband may leave me. I'll lose my job. So you say you love the world and things of the world more than we love God. He says, if you put me first, all these other things will be added. What you lose for him, you shall surely find. Friend, we're, we're going to be blessed if we just stand for what is truth and trust God. Amen. Bible sanctification. The devil says, I'm going to work over those who have little experience in the Word of God. What do you think that everybody here is working in the service of Christ encourage people to get into the Word? Yeah. Spend some time with Jesus, some wonderful time. Just, I mean, time talking to Him, listening. Because the devil said, I can, listen, I can work over those who are not studying. Their experience in the Word of God and they're very limited on the workings of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't seen the Holy Spirit working in your life, you haven't seen it working in the other people's life, you don't recognize the working of the Holy Spirit, you are a prime suspect. The devil says, I've got them. Why? They're not spending time in the Word. Dim it just a little bit, a little smoke screen, they're done. And then I'll go spend some more time on Mark. Seems like he's been in the Word. You, you see what I'm talking about here? I better, I've, got, I've got them over here. Let me go see you. See, Sister Yvonne, you've been in the Word. I, well, I'm worried about it. The devil says, I'm worried about that now. I'm going to leave these other ones alone. They're, they don't know. She's had some experience. Others of you had experience. Second group right here. Those who are satisf satisfied with a limited, limited of spiritual knowledge. 
In other words, you're just satisfied with, you know, you just have a limited spiritual knowledge, but you're satisfied. I'm good enough. How many times have you heard that? I, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm all right. Do this. I, I, one guy told me one time, so I, I'm, I'm all right. I said, well, you are? He said, well, yeah, I'll tell you how I'm all right. I said, I said well, I, I know there's a supreme being. or I think, I'm pretty sure there is. And that should be enough. I think I'll make it without. I said, oh, you won't. It's a good start. We, got to, we must believe that he is. You see, but we can't leave somebody in that darkness. We need to push something back out there to challenge them to move forward. He really thought for years because he recognized there must be a supreme being because everything, how's this all? Why? Must be something out there. It's not enough. The devil's going to work those people over. He's going to bring in those false prophets, those teachers who teach error, those seducers the Bible talks about. The teachers of doctrines of devils. This is heavy duty now. The professed believers. <laughs> God's people. You realize those people who profess to know the truth is more dangerous to God's people than persecution is. They even are now. I'm telling you, it's going to get worse. Think about it. It's more, you say, oh, now they can't be more dangerous. You know, Bill, you, know, you remember what Jesus said to the disciples? In Matthew chapter 24, tell us the signs of thy coming. You remember, tell us the signs. They were begging. I don't hardly hear anybody ever say to you, do you know any of the signs of the coming of Jesus? Do you see what's going on in the world today? They said, oh, tell us when you're going to come. Jesus didn't go into a bunch of prophecy about anything. He said, be not deceived. Three, what, four times in the book of Matthew 24, he said, do not be deceived because he knows the devil is going to try to what? Deceive us with false doctrines, seducers, right? Doctrines of devils, deceivers, professed believers. What's the plan of this group? Just, I just got down quickly, nutshell. What is the plan of these seducers, these deceivers? Number one, here's what they try to do. They try to undermine the confidence of the truth of God. Undermine your confidence that you have in the truth of God. So if we can undermine it a little bit and get you to what? Doubt, just a little bit. You're, he's got you where He wants you. Never doubt the Word of God. Even if you can't understand it, you, you can't explain it. By faith, you just accept it and say, He's God. Amen. He's God. He's going to help me to understand this. And when the Spirit of truth is come, what? John 16, 30, He will lead you into what? Into all truth. People don't know the truth because they don't want to be led into truth because they don't want to change in their life. The devil says if we can just undermine their faith, get them to doubt a little bit the truth of God. And then he says, you know, we'll go a little bit farther, point number two. I'm going to, try to, I'm going to make it almost impossible to distinguish between truth and error. It becomes so cloudy, so mixed up, that you just cannot distinguish between what? Truth and error. That's why the Bible says, if it were possible, what? He shall deceive even the very elect. If it were possible. It's not the very elect because they know the Word of God. They've been spending time in the Word of God. They're on their knees of the morning. They're on their knees in the noon. They're on their knees at night. They get up early in the morning to study God's Word because they know they will be deceived. They know they're going to lose eternal life if they don't grasp the hold of the Savior. And keep that, keep that, oh, keep that living connection. Jesus said, walk. You know, yet a little while, while the light's with you. You remember him saying you need to walk while the light's with you when he was here? Whoa, walk while the light's here. He said, if you don't walk while it's light, he said, darkness is going to come. I help me. Darkness is going to come up on you. That's what John 12 is talking about. And Lord, okay, we see how the, the seducers and the, the false prophets and people teaching heirs. And listen, some have the audacity to teach it right in front of you. They think you don't know any better. And most of them know that you're not going to be studying to show yourself approved. Let's just be honest about it. You know why? I hear too much the preacher said, pastor said, evangelist said. Some people say, well, the prophet showed up in church and they said. I say, well, who, who's the prophet? Well, Mr. Jones down the road, if you know what I'm talking about. I said, okay, that sounds good. Now, what did he say? 
God has people. He's called, he's prophet. They'll be operating in the church till, till Jesus comes. They have, er, er, you know, since the beginning of time. So I don't have a problem if somebody said, the prophet showed up at church. My, here's what I say every time. What did they say? I'm nosy. What did they say? Why? Because I, it depends on what they said or whether they're a true prophet or a false prophet. If they're going against Scripture, they are a false prophet. Look how the devil operated. He did, and I just put it down like four little points here, how the devil operated in heaven and how he operates ooh, in the church. Listen, yeah, oh, he's so, so subtle, how? Remember, he worked this way in heaven. I keep trying to say over and over, the devil does not change his tactics. He doesn't have to because it works. I mean, it's sad. It's sad, but it's, it works because most of the people... Remember, the Bible says uh, all the world wandered after the... Revelation 13, after the beast. They are those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. If that doesn't break your heart, nothing will. You don't care. You don't care for souls. I can't care for souls if it doesn't bother me when I read that. And I said, I want to make a difference. God, help me to make a difference through you. It doesn't have to be that way. You think when the flood was coming that Noah said, well, God said it's going to destroy it. There's not going to be anybody left but a couple of us. And I'll just do about my business. No, he pleaded. He begged. He knew the outcome. There's no doubt in my mind. He understood it well. But he begged and pleaded for those souls. Please, please. The enemy said, first of all, listen how he does it in churches today. Well, you have seen it maybe in other churches you've been in. First thing he does, he says, if I can divide the people, if I can separate them. Get it? Think about it. what? Divide the people is called divide and what? And conquer. That's, that's in every aspect of the world. It can be in a workplace. You have some people start going at each other and boom, boom, all of a sudden, you know, they can't agree anymore and they're working at cross purposes with each other. And then all of a sudden, it becomes so heated, so bad. Maybe not even a lot of words even said, but watch everybody start going their own way. Separation. The devil says a church that's united together, you know what? He cannot defeat. People that's united in the Lord and in the truth, he has no handle. When they came to Jesus, the devil came to Jesus, and what did he say? He came to me, but he found nothing in me. Woo, somebody needs to talk. You think about it. When the devil comes against you, he needs to look and say, I can't find anything against these people. What? Jesus lives in their heart and their mind. Amen. But does he really? So he divide the people of God, and then they begin to, they begin to separate and go different ways and, and have to start all over. And all over. Number two, he seeks to create a diversion or dissension in the church. We become unhappy. We call it contention. Nerves are on edge. Now, this is how the enemy operates. Very positive, real clear on all this. I'm not just making it up. Dissension and contention till ooh, once again, still, bottom line, divide, separate, go our own ways. And then the devil, if possible, tries to remove the old landmarks, the old pillars of the faith, which will always stand. They always have. The pillars cannot be moved, dear friends. They're rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. But he tries to remove the old pillars. He tries to remove some of the teachings in the church. He tries to deal with the Godhead. He tries to deal with, you know, the sanctuary message. He tries to deal with different things. Oh, it doesn't really matter. You've got the liberals, you've got the conservatives. You've got, how about just men and women of God? All right. you know, liberals and conservatives, the person needs to be a politician. Isn't that right? That's, that's what the politicians, that's what they look at themselves. This is, this is not the politician here. We're talking about yeah, life and death issue here. We're not just trying to get, oh, be careful. I almost said gets this pork barrel passed. You know what it's talking about in politics. Are you still with me? You don't say that in the pulpit, do you? No, I just did. Listen. See, we want something to go, so we attach a lot of other stuff with it. I've heard people say, well, I give this amount here, so we should do this. What are you giving? Why are you giving yourself? Why are you giving your means to the cause of Christ? Unless it's important. shouldn't want anything in return. God's going to bless. Remove the landmarks. And then he tries to appear, number four, the devil's always done that. He tries to make it appear that God in his word has contradicted himself. 
I've heard people say, well, I read it here, it said this, and I read it over here, it said this. It contradicts itself. Never. It's because of our lack of understanding we come to that, to grips. Upon real close scrutiny of Scripture, you will never find Scripture contradicting itself. But we have to study it. Some seem like it. Why? Because we're surface readers, we're one-liners. Listen, I tell you today, with all my heart, the false prophets, the false teachers, those presenting errors and... Must be, must be met head on. We have to be willing by God's grace, dear friends, to do battle. Because we're in battle. Oh, I'd like it for it to be easy. I'd like it for it just not to be any problems at all. But let me tell you, I'm blood bought. And He expects something from me. I want His blood, you see, to cover, to make it whiter than snow. I'm part of the family of God. I've got to stand for Him. And where the enemy is being brought in, we say, no, no, no. And you know the sad part, stuff that we've just talked about? It doesn't just come from the world. It doesn't come from just neighbors and friends. It comes from inside our own church, our own people that we love. This is the biggest test that we will have. You'll say, well, no, now, no, 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 look. Manuscript 11, 1906, this was written. So please pay attention. It says, even some of those who in times past the Lord has honored. Do you believe that God honors people? Absolutely He does. You look all through Scripture, God honored, God came near, God spoke to, God directed. And He's doing it today. Books could be written today. It's almost like fit in Scripture. You go, oh, God is leading, guiding, working, miracle working God, same yesterday, day, and forever. He's not changing. He's still God. And we get excited about some of these things here, but reality of the day and things we see happening, huh, well, what's the difference? In the miracle and miracle from God? Yeah. Message going to all the world, miracle. Amen. People hooking their little six-inch TV up to a little 12-volt battery out in the mountain somewhere, a little antenna out there. What? It's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome to me because I'm saying, who is so dedicated to do that? If you and I can't have the 60-inch screen and high def, somebody's not with me. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Isn't that what it is now? If it's not real crystal clear, it's not high def, it's not 60-inch screen, I'm not going to watch it on some little thing like I can't see it. You know what? We're not hungry for the Word. If we were, we'd say, oh, somebody feed me. And they'd write and they say, we're fed. We're starved to death. We love it. The truth of God's Word. Do we really love it? Listen, some of those in times past the Lord has honored. Notice this, sad. They will depart so far from the truth as to advocate misleading theories regarding many phases of the truth, including the sanctuary question. Have we not had some of those challenges? You better believe it. This is, you know, this is written before some of the big challenges by the Spirit of God. So these things are going to come in. We need to wake up. We need to see. He's, he's honored them. He's blessed them. He's led them. But now they've got off track. And some of us, we, we, well, we don't know. You have to know what truth is or you can't catch it. How far off track? See, people get a little offended. Oh, well, no, no, no. God's people now, they're not off track. We're so far off track, God help us. He was showing us in Old Testament times with Israel that he pleaded, that he begged, he embraced, he worked miracle after miracle for them. But his people whom he used and worked miracles in sight of the enemy, he won battles for them. He worked miracles for them. The Bible says in Psalms 106, uh, like verses 35 through 40, I'll put it in a nutshell, Israel, supposedly God's chosen people, they went worshiping idols, and they went so far to kill, sacrifice their own children to idols. You tell me they didn't go far away from what is truth? Were they God's people? Supposed to be. But look how far away. So we should never sit idly by and say, oh, that can't, won't happen to us. You get out of the Word a little bit, you quit praying, you watch what happens. Everything that can be shaken, will be shaken. And I tell you, if you're not spiritually fashioned down, you will be shaken out so fast you don't know what hits you. At the same time, saying it won't happen. 
See, I'm cautious about those who say, I'm saved, to me, it will happen if I'm not fastened down. See, I know that I tremble to think about it. It could be shaken out. But I know the only thing I won't be is if I'm really fastened upon that rock. No matter what hits, no matter how hard it hits, no matter who hits it, I'm still clinging to that rock by faith. Say, oh, God, help me. If I'm not doing that, if I'm not sinking my fingers, as it were, into that rock, really putting forth an effort, dear friends, I will be shaken out. The devil is not some little toy. He's not playing with you. He's determined to destroy you. That to me is a few minutes we have is a, is a warning. You give those warnings. And I'll say it this. If any person here, any person in the sound of the voice, all the DVDs, all the other stuff that goes here and there, I'm telling you, this is a warning that God has given. It's on my heart. I wake up with it. I get up with it. I go to bed with it in my heart and my back and my mind. He's saying if any neglect the necessary preparation. Did you get it? The great need of, of Bible knowledge. That great need of pain, put forth the painstaking effort mm, to learn what is truth will be shaken out. Did you get it? We're talking about painstaking effort. When's the last time a painstaking effort was put forward when you studied the Word of God? Think how many painstaking efforts we put forth in things of this world that doesn't amount to anything. I don't have time to study the Word of God. Well, you know what? Turn the TV off. Get rid of the computer. Shut your phone down. Spend a little time. There's time there. You can do it. I'm telling you, you can do it. It's a, it I'm saying this. It's a necessity. You can run your life the way you want. But friends, you have the same amount of time in the day that I do. And each one of us, right? That God has given to us. And He will hold you accountable for those moments that you idled away. That you wasted away and never spent in time with Him. Lord, we need that. God help us. We have to learn what truth is. I've got to be rooted, the Bible says, and grounded. Do you understand about being rooted in, getting some roots going here? I need to be built up in the Word of God. Read that in Colossians 2, 7 when you get the opportunity. Read that in the book of Ephesians 3, verse 17. If we don't, we will be swept away by errors that appear to be truth. That's the deception. No one intends for that to happen, but they have the appearance of truth and we can't discern because we we don't know oh man Lord help us friend I plead with you today because we we are blood bought because you're precious in his sight huh whoa Zechariah 2 8 said that you're the apple of his eye don't somebody start saying well I don't like apples that's too bad look we're not talking about that. You said, Jesus said, you are the apple of my eye. You know, he looks at every one of his children. All the blood bought in the world, they may reject him, but your blood bought. He loves you. He's seeking you. He said, they're still the apple of my eye. They won't listen to me. They won't follow me, but I still love them with an everlasting love. Oh, he said, oh, Lord, the Bible says they're talking about in Micah 6, 8. It said, it's our duty then to walk humbly with God. Did you get that? Love mercy and walk humbly before God. We don't stick up and walk like we're something or somebody because we, we've got something going on and everybody else saying, oh boy, how wonderful this is. That makes us more accountable to God. And to recognize that those good things be happening in your life is because the one living inside of you. He deserves all the praise, the honor, and the glory. We're to lift Him up. He said, I be lifted up. I will what? Draw all men unto me, not unto man. Not unto man's work. Not what man is doing. If any good thing come from me, it is Jesus Christ. It is not me because I have the other tendencies. Lord, help me. Somebody don't want to get real. Flesh has to die, you know. I'm blood bought. I, I, I want to walk humbly before Him. And I'll say this to the church today. Do not be seeking anything new and strange. I hear people, I say, oh, new light. Oh, there's new light. There's nothing. Most generally, what's new light to a lot of folks is because it's always been there, but they just found it. And then you have to check it to see if it's been there. See? Everything you say, oh, it's new light, new light. You've got to follow this salvational issues. Well, if it is, I want it. If it's not, then you're going to need to leave it alone. Fair probably said, don't you, don't, don't you seek anything strange and new. Why? Because lift him up. You're blood bought 
Talk about Jesus. Talk about what He's done in your life. He's gave you victory over tobacco. He gave you victory, you know, over drugs. He's gave you victory over the, 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 the lustful eye and the flesh. You're a new creature in Jesus Christ. You see, that's what it's all about. You go tell somebody that has these same problems today, and they say, oh, did God give you that victory? I want that. Oh, have mercy what we had to be grateful and thankful for. May I make another comment just before, because we hear so much about what I'm getting ready to say, and I want to make it real clear. We are never, ever to think that the chosen people of God who are trying by God's grace to walk in the light of truth compose Babylon. Somebody help me. Don't want to get into it, huh? It's heavy. As soon as you mention Babylon, everybody goes to peace and say, well, what would be being said here? I'm saying those, and people say, oh, no, we're not. Listen, if we are by God's grace trying, right, to walk in the light of truth that he gives it, you can't say that's Babylon. Do you realize Babylon talks about Revelation 17? When it says Babylon, that is the fallen denominational churches are Babylon. The second angel's message, are you still with me? Because they're advocating poisonous Doctrines to the soul. That wine of air you remember reading about there in Revelation 17. The wine of air. Oh, the time's running out. You know what, preacher? All he needs is one person to say, go on. They, all the others shake their head, no, 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 don't. If you hear one, go on. That's all you hear. That's all you hear is go on. Now, some of us not going to get this. I don't know how long I've been going on, but it goes fast up here. Maybe I'll just cover one of them, because I've got four errors most people are aware of, but yet the world is not. That the ed enemy has brought in, dimmed the eye, spiritual, we can't understand it. You know them well. False doctrines is the natural immortality of the soul. I want to bring a point to you. I don't know if you've thought about it before, and some of you are way past and much better than I am at it, but it's just, it really just sunk home to my heart. Natural immortality, immortality of the soul. They're simply saying the soul lives on what? After death, forever. It lives on after death, it keeps doing. Even though there's simple passages of Scripture, such as Ezekiel 18, 20, the Bible said, listen to me. The Bible said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now you're going to have to discredit that, twist it, abuse it, rip it out, or we've got problems. Because that is too clear. No, the soul lives on. After. The Bible said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Bible said, all have what? Sinned and come short of the glory of God. The sinner. The Bible, see, that's clear. I'm not going to do a whole study on it. I'm just saying, just that one passage. Why don't we say, oh, Lord, what are you talking about here? That's different than what the world's teaching. Now think. Soul that sinneth, it shall die, not live on. Then I got to thinking, oh. Let's make this point for a quick. I, I want to talk about whew, eternal torment. I want to talk about, you know, people believe that, you know, they deny the, 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 uh, the pre-existence of, of, of Jesus, you know, before the world and, and, and the seventh-day Sabbath. I can't go into all those because, oh, boy, those will get yummy and I'm going to get wound up. Yeah, I, I'm telling you, what a blessing that truth has been in my life and how I want to pass that on to anyone who has an ear open to hear. The truth will set you free. It will be an encouragement. But the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now think about this. The tree of life in the garden. Somebody go, oh, let's do Genesis. Just a couple of passages. Would you do it with me? Hello? Yes. All right, praise God. This, this will be a point. If you hadn't kind of looked at it this way, you'd say, oh, boy, now that's something I'm going to have to either accept or fight. And if you want to fight, do it with Scripture. I'm thinking about now the tree of life. Was there a tree of life in the garden before sin? Did we, do we think so? Genesis 2 verse 9. Genesis 2 what? Verse 9 it says, And out of the ground made the Lord grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. Good for what? Food. The tree of 
Woo! Also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Two different trees, isn't that right? He said in the midst of the garden was the tree of life. Now, if you wanted, Adam and Eve wanted to live, they must do what? Live forever, they had to eat of the tree of life, just like the redeemed will in the new earth. Amen. Still faith. He's the tree of life, we understand. But they had to eat or they would have died. Okay, now stay with me. Now it, it, it starts to get deep here. Genesis 3, verse 22. Genesis 3, verse what? And here's what the Lord said. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. In other words, they did what? They sinned. They took of that forbidden right. They ate, sinned. He said, Now their eyes are what? They're, they've been opened to good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. The conditions of living forever is what? The soul. You have to continue to eat from the tree of life or the soul that sinneth, it will die. This is some truth that you've got to dig deep into to see, look, this is what it is. Now what happened when they sinned and he cast them out of the garden? What happened? They began to die. What happened? Remember, what did God say? He sent an angel, the sword, and he, he, put, he put an angel there and he guarded the tree of life so that no man could eat from that point and be an immortal sinner. That's right. The sinner would live forever. And God said, that's not going to happen. I put an angel there. And now tell me this. Has any child of Adam, that's all of a family, has anyone got past that flaming sword? Then there is no soul that lives on and on. They're just not, it's not, it's not happening. Because the only way the soul can live on and on is to eat from that tree. And the angel was put there so that man would not eat for it after he sinned. And so the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. I'm thinking this is good stuff. Oh, when you think about it, this is good stuff. You hardly ever hear that argument put up, if ever. Never. And it just kind of says, oh, no one of Adam's family has passed that flaming sword. Not a one. Not one has passed. Therefore, the soul that sinneth, what? It shall die an everlasting death. Death that will last forever is what that means. Did you get it? And from where there, there will be no hope of any resurrection. Friend, this is heavy duty. Lord, help us. Yes, it is. Spirit of Prophecy says a little line extra on that. It was interesting. It says, Then the wrath of God will be appeased. Whew. It's hard for us to try to wager that in with a, a loving God. But remember... His wrath has to be appeased, the judgment. Soul that sinneth, it shall die. The only way the soul can continue to live is to eat from the tree of life. No man has done it since sin has entered. Lord, help us with that. We're not going to go any farther. It's too late. Because the other just gets, oh, love the truth. Yeah, I, just, I need more of it, you see. See, this is what it is when we begin to study. And get into the Word a little bit. It could be just a little tidbit for somebody or laughable to somebody else, but it did my heart good. See? And you know what? It made me want to get back into the Word. I got, I got hungry. And I want you to get hungry. Because, you remember, the closer you examine what truth is, the more they call it the acid test, the more you put on it, the brighter it shines. It never changes. No one can gainsay it. No one can disprove it. Because God says it's true. And I encourage you today. You're, oh, you're blood bought. <laughs> you're blood bought. We have everything to look forward to. The coming of Jesus. When the Bible, when God says, one day that old covering cherub, you remember him? He said, I will destroy him. He didn't say he's going to live on and on, burning in hell forever. He said, I'm going to destroy him in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou shall never be a terror anymore. Do you remember that? Ezekiel 28, 6 through 9. Do you remember that? The wicked shall not be, the Bible says. Even though you diligently consider, the Bible says, the place it shall not be. It shall be as though they have never been. 
This is heavy duty. You just read it and say, oh, yes, Lord, your way is the best. The Bible is clear. The root and the branches to be burned up. Who is the root? The devil. The workers, the branches, the workers. And you know who the workers? Yes. Those who disregard the law of God. I'd like to talk more about that. We can't do it because that is the standard of judgment. You see, the standard of righteousness is His law and which will be used in the judgment. Here it is. Here's the Ten Commandments. Have we by God's grace? See, have we by God's grace? Matched? That's what's going to judge. It's going to stand right there before us. And yet, you know what the devil says? Oh, done away with. Don't worry about it anymore. No. No. Too many passages of Scripture. We won't look at that now. Oh, it is... It's something to make us think to say, oh God. I like that song, I wonder have I done my best for Jesus. It's an old song. When he has done so much for me. Why? Because you're blood bought. You're purchased possession. You're special in his sight. You're the apple of his eye. Please don't make the sacrifice that he's given. Right? Null and void. You can claim it or you can reject it. Decision is yours today. Why don't you decide? Those who maybe haven't, why don't you decide? I want to be on the side of Christ. I want to be on the winning side. I already know what the other side. I already know what's going to happen. I don't want to be there. I want to live forever. Oh, I want to eat that tree of life and live forever. And you know what? By faith, when I open the Word of God right now, I'm eating. By faith, right now, until I get that opportunity physically to do it, I'm eating of the tree of life right here. That I'm guaranteed to live forever. Maybe not in this life, but you follow what I'm saying. In the life to come. Oh, we need to pray. Pray with me. Let's kneel. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for your precious word today. Oh, we thank you for revealing these beautiful truths to us. Or at least reminding us that, that you're a God who, who cares about us. You want us to understand. You want us to, to grasp a hold of the truth. And we realize you want us to walk that sanctified life. You want us to, And sanctification means a holy life. One that is, is, is diligently seeking for more of you. A, a life that's willing to grow, to be ra uh, rooted and grounded in the truth of your word. And Lord, though the storms of life are blowing upon us even now and will be more severe in the near future, there's not a hope for any of us here without you. We, we, we want to hang on, as it were, Lord. We want, the Bible calls it enduring until the end, the, the same shall be saved. Lord, help us to endure regardless of the winds that blow, the doctrines, the air, the devilish messages that come out, the untruths. May we understand what truth is. And then, by your grace and your strength, you live the life. You gain the victory you willingly offer to each one of us today. That we may, as we commit our mind to you, it, be, it, it becomes uh, united with your mind. When I give you my heart, it becomes united with what? Your heart. When I commit my will to you, it's combined with your will. And Lord, I thank you for that. That's what it means to wear the robe of your righteousness. Thank you, Lord, for that. In the precious name of Jesus, for those who've made that decision, maybe never before, right now, we give you praise, give you honor, give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.